And we are live on LinkedIn again. And so thank you everybody for tuning in to the safety view. And it's with a pleasure that Rose is gonna be leading us off today. Thank you, Tamara. So emotions are contagious. And our topic today is mental health and mental well-being. So even if I'm feeling really excited or happy, but if no one else in the group is, it could go either way. They could catch my feelings and get excited, or I could catch their feelings and, uh, and be worried or anxious, etc. So <clears throat> everything is intertwined. Every, nothing is separate. And yet I have, I've, have had many discussions on LinkedIn about the topic of mental health. And there seems to be an argument uh, that that is the province of HR. It's not really the province of safety, the safety professional. And I think part of that is, is a, it, it's a fear or perhaps, you know, um, even uh, it might be even be ethical because who am I to uh, try and help people uh, that are distressed or stressed when I don't have the competency or the skills. So I think it goes, uh, you know, both ways. Uh, what kind of keeps us out of it. But the information I want to share with you is very compelling about why we can't ignore it. Uh, and then I would like to have a discussion is, uh, you know, as to how we could begin to address this question from the safety professional viewpoint, put on our, our thinking hats and share that, you know, with our colleagues. So I'm going to uh, share my screen for a few slides with data because I find that data is always, um, it's always good. But before, oh, before I do that, I found an interesting definition on um, the International Labor Organization, which really talks about well-being as opposed to mental health. And mental health is one of the subcategories of well-being. And they defined it as uh, well-being relates to all aspects of working life from the quality and safety of the physical environment to how workers feel about their work, their working environment, the climate at work and work organization. The aim of measures for workplace well-being are to complement OSH measures to make sure workers are safe, healthy, satisfied, and engaged at work. And the uh, three subcomponents that they have identified for well-being, the first being mental health, the second one being psychological safety, and the third being social emotional uh, needs. Are they being met or not? So uh, with that, let me introduce some of the statistics. Uh, there was a global, the 2020 report hasn't come out yet, so I'm sure that it's worse than 2019, but 2019 was a pretty tough year uh, for the global workforce. So let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to press on share. And then I have to bring this up. Uh -huh, nice picture. <laughs> okay, here we go. And then I have to put it on present. <clears throat> let me know if it's working. It's loading, loading. Okay, is it working? Yes, I see yes. numbers. Yes. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna do is get rid of all the people so I can read my own slide here. Okay, so that's why I'm asking for Gary and Tamara to help co-host in the sense of, if anyone wants to make an observation or a comment, you know, raise your hand and um, they'll let me know that you would like to um, say something. So um, this first is from the 2019 uh, Wellbeing Institute. They do a global survey every year to check in on um, the well being of employees. And these are the issues that they found contributing to the negative workforce productivity by sector. So I will let you look at these. Um, the corporate sector is different uh, from the people who work for the government. And the multi-employer plans would be people that work for several, so they would be like contractors, um, so that, uh, that move from employee 
um, employer to employer and other groups that move around like gig workers. <clears throat> I'll let you look at those and let you make observations. Okay, what stands out? What stands out for you? So Rosa, I might say a couple of things. Yes, please. Um, I see the uh, expression work-life balance there, mm -hmm. which I, um, I think it has, you know, been helpful as much as, uh, as much as any kind of science is helpful, mm -hmm. but it doesn't serve our purposes anymore. Mm -hmm. It, it was, um, as far as I know, it was coined in the eighties in order to address a, you know, an issue with overwork and things like this. But, um, I, I think we live in a different era now. And a lot more of the wording I've heard is more um, work-life integration or mm -hmm. work-life infusion. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't uh, look at 2020 and the work from home phenomenon that everybody's living without acknowledging that there is an intersection yep. between these two worlds. It'll be interesting to see if they change the wording in the... Yeah. One the other thing I'd like to, to highlight is that I see absenteeism there. I mm -hmm. guess that's an easy one to count. This, this seems to be one of those metrics that we count it because it's easy, not because it's, it's helpful. Presenteeism mm -hmm. is not there. And yeah. I think presenteeism would be a much better indicator of mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. negative workforce right. productivity. <laughs> so that, you know, where people are just showing up, clicking the boxes and not engaged at all Mm -hmm. giving, having totally given up on having any, any uh, positive impact at work mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a much more important metric to be looking at. Yeah, I, I agree. It is, it is an important metric, but it's probably not used here. It could be that it's not used here because you have to get into people's heads to be to measure presentism, whereas absenteeism is, you know, at the tip of the iceberg, right? It's very visible. But it's interesting that absenteeism is not a concern in the corporate sector. Right. Uh, and there could be rules because if you're absent, you don't get paid, right? So wow. all those things could be in play. We just don't know on that one there. Hmm. The one that's um, the big bucket for me is concerns of workers. Is that kind of like, I'm, I say something, but I'm not being listened to. I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure what that means. Actually, I think Gary, it is, it's one line, personal financial concerns of workers. I th oh. think that's all one line. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it, thanks sir. Okay, mm -hmm. that helps. Okay. So that Just back to, your, back to your point, Tanya, about balance. Um, it almost feels that there's a trade-off, right? There's that either or thing. Mm -hmm. I think what you're trying to say, it's a both end. How can we get work and life integrated together here? And, yeah, some of the research that we've been doing because of COVID-19 has pointed to a couple of weak signals, which I thought I'd just raise here. Mm -hmm. One is that we're seeing a lot of fatigue, a lot of exhaustion because of COVID-19. I don't know if that would show up here because this is probably pre-pandemic. I think it could show up under stress, don't you? Because I, do, I don't know. It's, it's a big bucket, stress. and I think you got to kind of like, it's too, it's too high. It's not granular enough for me to understand that. But Rosa, oh, you said that's... this is 2019 data, right? right. Yeah, so it's, <clears throat> so it's pre, right? Yeah, it, it's really... it, I, I think it, it's going to be radically different. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, the other one that's really interesting is the um, <clears throat> what we call disruptive work practices. We like as humans to kind of get into routines. We start work at eight o'clock in the morning, we finish at four and all the things fit in here. What we're discovering of course now, and that's a good and a bad, is that work is episodic. We're on Zoom meetings. But then in between, you do something until another Zoom meeting comes up here. Yeah. We're on different time zones now. So in some cases, my day starts at 5 a.m. in the morning because of the people in the UK, it's morning mm -hmm. for them. 
or it could be eight, nine o'clock at night because of the folks in Australia. So that's a good thing on one hand, because I have that flexibility and I can talk to people around the world. The other hand too, it's, you know, you get like, are you coming to bed? Why are you getting up so early in the morning for? So I am a disruptive force mm -hmm. to my spouse. Yeah. One of the things that I, and maybe it's in stress and it's because stress seems to be a bucket, but um, what about the unpaid load? So work that people are doing, but they're not necessarily being paid to do it. So they're, oh, yeah. they're, go, they're extending beyond mm -hmm. yeah, compensation. Because, yeah, right. Good point, Tanya. I mean, Tamara, <laughs> we have two T's here. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, because there's a, even if you're not, if you're working in the home and you, you're taking care of children and managing all of that, that, especially with the children not being in school now. Well, it's also if, if you're doing a lot and then you're not being appreciated, mm -hmm. that's going to be demotivating. Right. And then that kind of feeds into the absenteeism. Right. Or, you know, just as you say, you can be at work, but not even be there. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if these also would be broken down by industry, because, for example, in oil and gas with uh, all the layoffs and the price of oil dropping, um, I bet I would bet that their um, uh, numbers would be, you know, past the roof because of what they're going through right now. Yeah. I, I, I would like to comment on the work-life balance that runs across all of these sectors and hypothesize or project to the future due to COVID in strangely allowing the individual to make work-life balance choices much more freely and adaptively than we've experienced pre-COVID. And I wonder, mm -hmm. If, if I'm correct about that, what that will do to the sense of stress, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That, that confidence and trust that people can, can balance work and life more adaptively to their own needs. And then the other thing with work and life, and I've written a lot about this, is if we are lucky enough to be in touch with our purpose, we actually live through our work, meaning we get a great sense of satisfaction and fulfillment and going for a hike can be a great deal of work. So it, what I'm saying is it's in your perspective. And as long as we know when it's time to back away from either activity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and adapt as we need, that's just so de-stressing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good point. Right. Yeah, very good point. Okay, I, I have another slide I want to show you. Hold oh, on. Just one quick question. Can I just, can I just say one thing on, on what Lisa had said? Sure. There's, um, the Economist has been running a bunch of videos on YouTube. I haven't seen them all, but mm -hmm. there was uh, one that I used in a talk that I recently gave on how work as we see it, you know, the eight to four, going downtown, occupying an office, comes from the industrial revolution when there were looms you know of being able to weave all of these uh you know um for sheets of fabric kind of thing and that um we didn't necessarily um realize any of the uh, possibilities of the internet until this virus forced us to. Mm. I mean, we have been living the industrial revolution I, conception of work both in time and in the way that we, we allocate that time because before the industrial revolution, you know, it was more craftsmen and they worked when they could and they were paid for the work they did, not the time that they showed up kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we have gone to a time showed up model, which was, which doesn't suit our needs anymore. So great point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to terrible. build on, oh, to build on that too. Um, if, um, if you look at just even how schools are managed, it's all the cycle around the farming community, at least up here in Canada. 
And again, we're seeing that same struggle. We're trying to use models that were historically built yeah. for a purpose before, and we have not pushed ourselves to adapt to our modern way of, of what we need. You know, and I and I find it interesting because as the mainstream starts coming on more online, it'll be more interesting if they'll be open to okay. learning from those who have been online for decades, because this is really just the tip of the iceberg for yeah. the what can be done. And my concern is as an online developer is people will see this this small piece and say, oh, that's it. Great, we'll just use Zoom, and then they'll we'll lose again that evolution nice. of going forward even more. Yeah, yeah. there's a wonderful um, YouTube, and I'll, I'll post it in the chat by Sir Ken yeah. Robinson, when he talks about the education system following the factory model mm, and yeah. how we actually, yeah. from K to twelve, we just put kids through different classes, and you move on. We do get some rejects, so they fail. But the whole idea is to get them through the assembly line so they can graduate here. Very fascinating. I'll let you look at that. One question though, Rosa, do you know if in this survey here, this is a survey where all of these categories were there, you just tick the box on? Because the one that's not there for me, and I'm curious, is ethics. I don't see it there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if people had a choice to pick ethics or not, or if it just wasn't on well, the list. I, I Probably, I don't know because uh, the report only goes over, you know, these results, but it doesn't break them down and it doesn't indicate that there were any interviews or anything of that nature to find out, um, uh, you know, why people responded in the way they do. But I want to, uh, I want to make an observation is that I, we're, we're like accumulating all of these uh, great ideas that are really, I think, part of the solution. So I mm -hmm. hope you all remember these things because I, I think what we're talking about is that we've been, the way that we have approached these, this situation isn't really working that well and, and we need some different ways. So let me just show you the next slide and then we can get into the, the brainstorming bit. Um, let's see if this will work. Okay, hang on. Oh, there it is. Okay, so um, the uh, of the 3.2 billion workers uh, are increasingly unwell, and this again was 2019. Um, and again, these figures, uh, regardless of the exact vocabulary, uh, these figures are staggering to me. Uh, the the economic insecurity, which we just seldom hear about that. Uh, we, we hear a lot about COVID uh, and I don't think we've even begun to realize uh, the significance of the, um, of the economy and, and what we're going to be facing as we go forward. And this, of course, I think that uh, looking at these numbers, I have to ask safety professionals, um, you know, if if they believe that these problems are left at the door when when people enter the building and enter the workplace, or That's do these right. issues still weigh heavily, you know, on their minds? And and what does that mean for uh, for the safety professional? For safety think in general and productivity, I think this is really powerful data. And if the safety professionals haven't understood the impact of mental health on safety and performance, that's pretty compelling data. Tamara, I'm sorry I talked over you. No, uh, that's okay. Uh, we both get so excited when Rosa starts bringing up all these issues. Right. It's like, it's like, wow, you know? One <laughs> of the things that I'm very concerned about also is that people are gonna believe that once we have COVID um, reasonably you know, under some sort of control that all this again will go away. And it won't because the fact is that these issues were actually there before COVID. It's just now that COVID is bringing it to the surface more visible because more people are impacted. But I know in retail, when I'm working with marginal workers who can't even afford, they have to decide, am I paying rent or am I paying for the heat? Nobody should be living in our modern society that way. 
So these are issues that a health and safety professional should really have on their radar continuously. Absolutely. So I guess the question is why, why isn't it? I, I really do believe it's that, that separation of, you know, seeing, seeing safety as something that's only related to the tangible. It's only related to the knives and the bottles and the cords that you might trip over. It's all so physical. And what isn't seen, especially in the scientific organizations, is not valid. Mm -hmm. Right. Look at COVID and people's inability to adapt to the, the constraints and the guidance on how we should manage and nobody can see it. How can it harm me? Um, and, and so I think there's something about this recognizing the intangible is super powerful and is just as powerful, if not more, because you can't see it than what we can observe. Yeah, well, the intangible. So that's one aspect of it. It's intangible. I wanted to just piggyback actually on what Lisa is saying from a work mm -hmm. experience myself, where I uh, had one worker who was a diabetic and epileptic, and it was a real struggle in order to provide him the safe, healthy work environment that he needed for his individual needs. And to the point where, you know, um, management uh, was putting him on the ice cream, um, putting ice cream into the sh into the freezers, and it was it was very hard for them to understand that somebody who had those um, those health um, challenges, when they need a break, they need a break right now. They don't have 10, 15 minutes to take the ice creams um, back to the back freezer and then take a break like somebody who doesn't have um, those health needs. And even that there, that should be part of what we consider under health and safety, right? Because, and, and when I'm trying to bring this up, they didn't get it. They're like, well, this isn't a health and safety issue. He needs to go to his doctor. And it's like, what? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and it was a whole frustrating thing um, as somebody who did understand why health and safety kind of went hand in hand there, working right. with the corporate people who, you know, like I remember when workplace bullying legislation came out, it was very dismissive. And it's like, well, that's not what we do. That's, that's somebody else's, even though it was in the occupational health and safety legislation. So a wake up call is needed in our industry. I wonder how much of that has to do with a lack of education. Like even if I did notice, what what would I do about it? Um, uh, and, you know, the other because the other uh, really disturbing factor is the rise in the suicide rate. Uh, and uh, I know some companies don't even uh, talk about it because they they think it will depress you know all the other employees, but. If we were to be able to, you know, are educated in the early signs and some simple things uh, that we could do, and Lisa, you could probably talk more about that point. You know, there's things that you can actually do to to help a person seek help. Uh, but if we don't even talk about it, how that how how can we affect it? Rosa, it reminds me of uh, us not seeing the gorilla walk through yes, um, yes. in the basketball court. I mean, what we're told to look for is what we look for. And so how do we change the schema? How do we shift the paradigm so that, back to Tamara's point, safety and health are truly integrated as one entity that we see them, yes, distinct, but also combined. I see Gordon, uh, you're on. Yeah. I, I like put in the that. chat. <clears throat> yes. My apologies. I, 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 as you can tell by the porthole behind me, I'm actually on a ship offshore Taiwan. But I love uh, joining in uh, when I can, irrespective of the time zone, or I take the re uh, recording, which is really cool. But yeah, ladies and gents, from from uh, my perspective, like in the maritime uh, world, I know we all have our acronyms uh, in Canadian, American, OSHA, and that we have HSE uh, in the UK and Europe. And uh, a lot of people forget about the H being health. Yes, yes. Do forget. 
do forget uh, entirely, unless you're in the nuclear industry or where there's monitoring, uh, occupational health monitoring, they, they forget that the H is health. And for us in the maritime world, it, it has been a, a really big wake up call, primarily because we were always seen as mariners or seafarers to be isolated anyway, to put up with it. We make our sacrifices, it's the job we chose. Uh, and when we're, uh, of course, um, although in modern times we're change, trying to change uh, the face of the employability and that is very much a male dominated uh, sector. So uh, we're always uh, roughy tufty, hairy chested, uh, get on with it, you know, like the, the old stereotypes of welders uh, in fabrication yards, etc. So there's always that inability for the for the male to to speak up or talk about issues that are affecting their mental health and well-being. So just an example for the audience here, the way we deal with it is we actually make it a point to talk about it at Toolbox Talks. I actually work on construction vessels, uh, oil and gas, uh, environmental and uh, offshore wind power related. So we try and incorporate them in Toolbox Talks. That means if somebody senior is talking about it or the deck foreman or somebody else is talking about it, then it gives encouragement to the rest of the team to be able to, to talk about it. And, and how is it talked box. about, Gordon? How, how is it talked about? Well, we're multinational, uh, and uh, I think currently we have something like 15 different nationalities, but our toolbox talks, our presentations are usually given in as a minimum two languages, if not three languages. So it helps, first of all, to be able to communicate and talk in the same language. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and other, other ways we do it is through presentations or webinar invites uh, such as these to talk about it. And other institutes that I belong to that are maritime uh, re uh, organizations and related like the nautical institute um, we've got one running uh, next week which is on mental health and well-being uh, and that would ordinarily be a members only thing but we've now changed them and we're going to make that uh, an open invite so within my maritime network whether it's on linkedin or through professional organizations or or even uh, colleagues that i've got back in the uk or colleagues here in taiwan i've, I've given the invite to them so they can all talk about it but I think from the macho environment that my discipline sort of orientates from, uh, a lot of things are, are working well. Um, we've got a man up, speak up uh, um, organization, which promotes, uh, especially where you're in a male dominated or the, you know, the macho sort of uh, uh, it, um, workplaces, if you like, uh, that it then facilitates uh, men being able to speak about being lonely, being isolated. Of course, the mariner, although is used to it, because we're not with our family, with our loved ones, we don't get to go home every day uh, or every evening. We don't have weekends off. We work 24-7, and because of COVID now, weeks and weeks, and if not months. So, uh, for instance, my rotational work would have been four weeks of leave at home with my family and then four weeks on a ship. Now I'm currently doing two weeks at home with my family and up to eight weeks on a ship. Oh, my gosh. But... It might not shock you, uh, but I'm one of the privileged ones because uh, I've got an air link that gets me from uh, the UK to Taiwan. So I can actually fly to work, which is facilitating that rotation. But if you think that's bad, a lot of the guys on here are doing six months uh, rotations on here because their country is actually in lockdown. There's no flights going to it. So from a maritime perspective, we do uh, have to deal with uh, a lot of influences that are outside of our control uh, and to be able to stay sane. I know uh, one of the ladies that mentioned earlier about suicide and that uh, the seafarer is in one of the highest categories as our medical doctors. My daughter is a veterinary nurse, uh, which is another um, category that's high on that. And it's not only because they have um, the facility or the access to drugs uh, to take uh, those events into their own hands. It, 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 it's down sometimes to the stress of the environment or the long hours that are done or uh, expectations. So especially in the caregiving uh, community where you're, ex you know, the expectation is a vocation and that's, you love doing it without realizing that you'll do all those excessive hours and you'll be there to help people uh, wherever and whenever you can. So it's not such a structured, not wishing to uh, denigrate anyone that works in an office or a factory, but uh, you, there are established work hours clocking on and clocking off, for example, where that, that can be facilitated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I hope, I hope that gives you a little uh, insight. Well, it, it, it's, uh, it's staggering to me, uh, Gordon. I mean, there's just, uh, people are amazing, aren't they? How they adapt and make things work. Um, and yeah, but there, there's, there's always that point of resilience. Yeah, there's I'm, a lot of resilience. And, um, unfortunately, with mariners and that, there's already a built-in expectation that you have some resilience in these uh, challenging COVID times because naturally your work is away from family or away from home or it's not done in your country. You're done on a ship isolated with a certain amount of crew members and that. But well, we do have uh, someone here, Andy. I don't know if you can speak, Andy, but Andy's in Saudi Arabia. And I think it's been several months since you saw your family, right? Yeah, I can speak. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Andy. <laughs> see you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, do you know it's it is it's interesting, right? I've I've got busy. Um, I think I think being busy, doing something creative and constructive, and adding value in some way is a is a great stress reliever. I don't know whether it, it fixes issues, maybe it postpones them, but yeah, fifth of January, twenty twenty, I came out here. It's now the third of December. On the 15th of December, I fly home and I find myself, I'm going to admit something out loud, I find myself getting very emotional looking at acts of kindness on Pinterest and things like that. I think that might have something to do with the need to go home very soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's been building for a while, uh, to be honest. But, yeah, the yeah. other thing uh, to appreciate, uh, maybe like Andy as well, uh, when you do work, uh, globally or, or, or not in your home nation, the, the impact on, on quarantine uh, that is around the globe at the moment. So for instance, this year alone, I have done four sets of 14 day quarantine. So that's something that, that ordinary uh, Joe public are not used to. Yes, we've had lockdowns uh, at various forms in different countries and we've had what they call isolation or, or stay at home. But of course you're ordinarily there with a family member I do appreciate some people live alone, but uh, you know th there's still that latitude to, to go shopping, even if it's online or something, or to do something yeah. like that. Uh, whereas the, the, the quarantine that you're doing in foreign countries is government enforced and it's police monitored. Your phone <laughs> is tracked so that you cannot leave the room. So whether it's in a government uh, compound or a government authorized hotel, basically the door shuts behind you and you don't leave that room for the 14 days your food is delivered outside if you opted for the pay for food option or you can use whatsapp line and order online and have it delivered to your room but to cut a long story short you are in that room and it might be an eight by ten feet room and you're there for 14 days mm -hmm. um, some people that are not used to that you know it's not your home you have no family members uh, and you have to make do with it exercise keep your mind active and uh yeah, from my background with resilience in these sort of situations or isolation, which is a bit more purist isolation, but not a lot different than a correctional facility. But of course, even in a correctional facility, you get to meet everyone else and you have an hour walk around in a, in a yard outside. <clears throat> in quarantine, you don't. Uh, and obviously on a ship, you can't. So there are similarities uh, with a prison environment, if you like. So uh, mm. yeah, there are ways around it. I, uh, for me, uh, I joke about it, but I, I'm a lot more productive and get a lot more work done. There's a lot less interruption from work colleagues. <laughs> you can plan your own day and your own hours when you when you want to do do it. Uh, and like I think Tamara was uh, mentioning earlier about, uh, and Rosa also about the industrial revolution and how we have adapted to uh, turn up somewhere and, uh, and, the, and the production goes ahead of us or whatever we're doing in Ali Valley. Whereas, in those situations where you, irrespective of time zone, you can choose when you wake up, when you go to sleep, when you work, how much you work, what effort you put in. And, well, uh, Gordon, I think you've triggered a couple funny, of people, yeah. Gordon, <laughs> because there's, uh, there's a couple of people that have been raising their hands. So yeah, I don't go know ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Who's been raising their hand? <laughs> All I saw was a notification that two participants raised hands. Well, I, I did. But I've always got a story to tell, and I don't know whether Tanya wants to oh, talk first. Wait a first. minute. Who, did somebody want to add to what Gordon was saying? Uh, was that mm. you, Gary, or Gary was raising their hand? Tanya and oh. Andy rose their hand. Yeah. Okay, Tanya, go ahead, Tanya, and then Andy. Okay. Uh, Tamara, that was from like half an hour ago. 
<laughs> but I'll say you're not doing a good it. job of monitoring yeah. that. <laughs> I, I really liked what Gordon was saying about the freedom to adapt. And that's kind. He, I think you said it more eloquently than I, Gordon. But I had started with that. I think that one of the upsides, strangely, of COVID and being um, put many of us back in the workplace through our home office, it allows us that flexibility. And mm -hmm. I think that brings us a sense of, I have control over my environment, which if it isn't tested by having kids climbing all over you and you know, you're not worried about money, et cetera, it actually brings a great deal of um, self-worth and mm -hmm. value and- Empowerment. And empowerment. Yeah, That's yeah, true. which is yeah. very strong and motivator. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So Andy, yeah. I, I cut you off. I have a question for you, Andy, uh, because okay. we we're talking about the male environment, and I know you work in a male environment. Although there might be a few women there. Uh, have you? Were, are you able to talk about your loneliness? Uh, do people ask you about it? I just, um, not very often. I think would be the absolutely honest answer. Um, yeah, I think I, well, you know me, I, I tried very hard. I, I came up with a, a sort of guide to mental health and a guide to keeping your sanity in, in lockdown and so on. And that's what I was going to comment on about the, the 14 day in, in isolation. Um, you know, I, I had to write the policy for, for the company, right? And we've had about 600, 600 people at one time or another more than that actually have gone into you know that 14 day isolation we have housekeepers that look after clients in our in our hospitality business um, and we had one housekeeper who was looking after somebody who tested positive so went into 14 days isolation came out and the following day cleaned somebody else's room with test positive and went back into 14 days for isolation right 28 days is a long time in a room getting getting food served to you right um, so um, I've, I've got a couple of examples, I think, that I, that I wanted to, to share. Rosa, you, you know this story already because it's a very powerful one. And I, I thought, you know, where I am in the Middle East with the uh, um, slightly less of a tender touch, should we say, towards employment, um, it it's, it's can be really, really tough for some people. But uh, yeah, we, we're right at the beginning of this. We had two drivers that were uh, that were driving people that um, that were positive, so they were the first in our company that had to go into isolation, um, and they weren't very happy at 14 days in a small room getting food delivered, not allowed out. Um, so they were causing some issues. Um, the issues were escalated right up to the uh, the CEO, the general managers, we call them of that of that group company. Um, who phones them personally. Um, and normally in the command and control organization, that would be a shout at you and tell you what to do. Um, but I'm very pleased to say that what Khaled did was phone them up and say, I need your help. Um, we're going through something that we don't understand. Um, if you are sick and you do have the virus and we allow you to interact, uh, you could spread the virus through, and you've got to understand we've got 500 and 1,000 people in a, in, a, in a camp, right? And people share rooms with four people and so on and so forth. So if you, if you spread this round, you could shut down the camp, you could shut down the business, and you could affect the ability for us to put food on the table because we can see a financial crisis coming as well. So I would like your help. And for a powerful person to ask for a very junior person's help is a, a big deal in where, where we are. So uh, they, they went back to the room very humbled and a little bit terrified that the general manager had phoned them personally. But then Khaled went home and made dinner and took dinner to them personally to thank them for, for, for their help. Now, I believe that story will run and run and run. And when they, instead of sharing anger round about the camp, they shared a story of a caring general manager and a bit, we're in this together. And that was that company is one of our most resilient through the uh, through the virus. Um, so uh, a lot of big issues. Um, I think acts of kindness and a thank you and personal support do actually help us get through it. It's nice to know somebody cares. 
Any, any really good story, and it reinforces the point about we don't really want the leaders telling stories. We want them to take actions so other people can tell stories about them. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, tell leaders to tell less stories, says he, and uh, tell yeah. other people's stories and say Yeah, take actions, yeah. and they'll tell really good stories here. So, that, so we had a situation where we, we had um, our clients send some people down to the States, had to come back. They were quarantined in a hotel. And they were doing the same thing, Andy, getting fidgety, whatever, because I think we realized these are busy people. Mm -hmm. They want to do something and they just feel so frustrated they can't do anything. So we actually got them to start sharing stories, reflecting on their experiences down there and say, what did you learn there that we can take back to us and put that in place? And that kept their minds occupied. So I kind of relieved that period. And plus, we, and plus the managers got something useful out of it as well. So we do have some people on LinkedIn too, who have um, put in some comments. Okay. And so uh, one of the comments one person had is for, with regards to the quarantine, why not send them home? It's against the law. Yeah, I can't transport There you people. go. Well, <laughs> it depends why you're in quarantine as well. Yeah, yeah. You don't want yeah. to spread, right? Yeah. No. Well, it was a question. question. I wonder yeah, why question. they asked that question. Uh, I'm not sure what's behind that question. If you, if you're listening, why, why were you curious as to why we don't send them home? Since obviously everybody knows that it's to control contagion mm -hmm. uh, what's behind that question are there any if, other I, if, if I can add uh, if you're looking oh. uh, for instance at those that are working globally or not in their home nation why weren't they sent home yeah and the notion of key workers uh, comes in here because if if you're a diplomat foreign affairs <clears throat> working in the nuclear energy industry more importantly if you're somebody that's working in the medical practice operating and working with the creation of a vaccine. Um, seafarers were noted as a key worker because at the end of the day, that's what all the logistics uh, that brings all the goods and services around the world uh, uh, still entails uh, and the emergency services. So it's it, it, for those of us in those um, branches of key workers that operate globally, like in myself, uh, building critical infrastructure for energy, uh, for electricity via offshore wind farms, these projects cannot just stop. Also in the oil and gas industry, they need all the maintenance and well, you just can't walk away from them and pretend that they'll mm -hmm. just keep on going. They have the effects of the sea and wear and tear on them. So a lot of people do have to work internationally uh, by the very nature of their trade. So it's not as simple as saying, send them home. Home would involve getting on an aircraft and, uh, and uh, potentially affecting all the other passengers on there, uh, the other passengers and all the air crew who also uh, they employ for the duty of care to put for, don't wish that. And this is why when the uh, PCR COVID tests uh, became uh, more prevalent, then that was yet another criteria to have a COVID PCR test before boarding an aircraft. Most countries now will insist three working days prior to entry that you've had that done, even though you're going into quarantine. And like in Taiwan, which has had only eight deaths uh, since it started, as opposed to the UK, which is I think 55,000 plus now, in, in deceased, that tells you how some systems work uh, and others don't. So having a PCR test before uh, going to another country, then doing on top of that their 14 day quarantine uh, mm -hmm. so there is one, one way of how not to send people home. Of course, if you're in your home nation and working, why don't they send you home? That, that, that is the case that you can self-isolate. A lot of countries will stipulate that if you're living with other people, then you must have a separate room with separate bathing and washing facilities. And that's quite not gene generic now around uh, different countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So if you have a civic, of course, uh, you can go home, but not everyone has that. So if you're being sent home and you actually live with a, uh, an or elderly parent with underlying health conditions, uh, for example, mm -hmm. then that would be another reason not to go home. Uh, and of course, uh, in the UK, a lot of um, hospitality, hotels, bed and breakfast, uh, motels, all shut down during lockdowns 
So in fact, there wasn't an alternative like that to go to. Mm -hmm. So you had to look to other family members that maybe lived on their own or had those extra facilities. So it's a very good question to ask for those, and of course the person asking it might not have the experience or, or knowledge of, mm -hmm. of how others have had to operate during mm -hmm. uh, no. yeah, uh, for various reasons, whether outside your home nation or, or within your home nation. And this is the great thing about a show like this, is that we're meeting people globally doing so many different things. So what I may never be exposed to, like offshore rigging, for example, you know, I'm now getting to see some of that world by talking to somebody like Gordon. So it's really a beautiful thing. And we had another question that came up with Mike. It's kind of more of a thought, though, is that he's he's saying, you know, we'll send somebody to the doctor if they've broken their arm or they've gotten a physical injury in health and safety. So what is it that is keeping us from you know, doing the same thing if we're seeing somebody who is under depression or anxiety, sending them to a doctor to help with that mental health. He, he wanted to see what the group's thoughts are were on that. I, I, can answer I, that. I, would like to, I would like to present kind of a, a radical perspective. And of course, there's many answers to that question. But um, I'm reminded of a very, uh, it's, a, it's a very famous, um, documentary on an offshore um, rig that was where a psychologist was hired to come in and work with the group because there was a really high number of incidents uh, going on. And the breakthrough um, thing for them was that the reason people, okay, there's two, that there were two things. One is if I approach you and ask you because you are appear to be uh, stressed or lonely, then I may be, uh, you may be losing face because I'm actually, you know, coming up to you and saying, hey, you know, what's wrong? And that can make the person, you know, withdraw or retract. The other thing is that um, when there is, when you cannot talk about your feelings or your doubts, it, it boils down to not being able to ask questions or reach out for help. And this impacts directly, for example, they were saying, uh, some of the employees were saying, yeah, like I didn't know how to use this gauge for years, but I was afraid of asking how to use the gauge because I didn't want to appear to be incompetent. So I, I just want to present that into, um, into our thinking that there is actually a lot of stigma attached to um, mental health issues. So people don't like to be called out for it and they certainly don't like to volunteer the information. Yes. Oh, yeah, Lisa, that's, you're muted. That's a wonderful yeah, we, uh, feed into my comment on it, which links back to the, what do we set up societally and in the organizations as acceptable? What are those parameters? And as long as we continue to see mental health as something we should be ashamed of, of course, we're going to, to hold back speaking up, sharing that we have issues. Yet once we can get to a place where we embrace mental health is so critical to safety as so critical to performance and we see that relationship all of a sudden it loses the stigma so how do we make that transition and i have to say i think COVID is this dark gift that's going to help us get there yeah uh, gordon yeah Can I, I, I uh i was gonna add I was going to ask that, um, how do we go about it? Firstly, uh, under the UK uh, law, uh, which is uh, similar to the European one, under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, it is legal and it is written in there that uh, the mental health and well-being uh, is part of the duty of care of an employer. So this year alone was a big wake-up call for all those employers that hadn't actually read that part ever before and assumed that the H in HSC, which is occupational health, and uh, if you have to go to the dentist or you have to do a fitness as part of your employment or, or working at high, or, or et cetera, yeah. then you just did that. It was a big wake up call when it actually stipulates there the mental health and well being uh, of, of the employees. 
so globally, the, the maritime industry runs along the lines of best practice or the guidance, uh, predominantly it's from the UK or Norwegian or European, and, and in part some American uh, uh, input as well. So it's good to see that uh, that that's now uh, only due to COVID that that's had a, a bigger impact. Uh, I, I think the UK is very different from from the US, uh, Gordon, because um, the, I see a lot more from there talking about these issues and integrating it. Yeah. Uh, whereas in the US, we don't do that. I know Andy Andy had a comment there uh, because the question isn't. Uh, putting it into the law, as far as I'm concerned, it's part of the law, it's part of the procedure, it's part of the job description. So then the question is, why don't we do it? That was the person's question. Why? What keeps us from taking the same kind of action on, a men, on an emotional injury uh, versus a physical injury? Because that's what we're talking about. Andy, yeah. what are you going to say? I, I, think, I think it's kind of hard to spot. I think that's the issue. We, you, you can all work out when somebody's hit the hit the thumb with a hammer, or just about to. But it, it's kind of hard to spot health issues, and I, and I don't think it's just mental health issues. If you look at uh, statistics for, you know, lung damage and musculoskeletal issues and things like that, it, the the things that are in the long term damaging that you don't get damaged straight away by sometimes are a little bit hard to spot. Um, I, I've got, uh, I really like, uh, there's a charity called Mind who uh, talked about well-being as being a dynamic mental state. Um, and, and they kind of give some, you know, for me as, as a lay person, some, uh, some headings that I find are really good to turn into questions. So well-being, they talk about you're able to feel and express a range of emotions, feel engaged with work feel confident in self-esteem, live and work productively, cope with the stress of everyday life, and adapt and manage in times of change and uncertainty. Now, what, what we were doing with some of the initiatives that, that we were running is we were asking people, do you have what you need to do your job safely? Actually, we were just saying, do you have what you need to do your job? Because safety is an outcome of work. Um, and people started speaking up and we, and it's like the big disasters that we all hear about. Everybody knew, but it wasn't okay to talk about it. So you need to give people permission to talk about it and, uh, and, uh, and create that environment where they start speaking up. So then if you start layering in some of those other questions that, um, and that quote came from the mental health package, for want of a better expression, that we put together, just ask people. Do you feel that you can add value? Do you feel self-esteem? Do you feel like this? And if the answer is no, we told people don't give anybody advice, just listen, because we're yeah. not equipped to give advice, but we're equipped to listen. And if it sounds like somebody's really struggling, now you've got an opportunity to, to refer on. But constantly having those conversations in a trusting relationship then you start you can start peeling back some of the issues that people will eventually speak up and like 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 another story i told you rosa one of my guys said you know i'm, I'm really struggling to overcome my speech impediment right and when, when it's okay for people to bring out those things that guy's been carrying stress for a long 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 time at work years and years and years and it was okay to speak up which for me means he's kind of getting over it right so you know it's it's you got to ask really good questions and make it okay for people to speak about them. Right? Well, first you have to develop the yeah. trust. That's what you're saying, Andy. For sure. You don't have the for trust, sure. you're not going to speak up. At least I see you have your hand up. However, it is nine o'clock. So okay. I was picking in with Tamara here. Yeah, no, uh, if people are open to going a little bit further, that'd be great. Because um, Lisa, you, you say your comment and then I've got something I want to piggyback off of what Andy just said. And, and I, I want to know what Bill Nelson has been taking notes too. about. <laughs> and Bill's been very quiet. All right, so we're here. All right. All right, so we know our order. I'll, yeah. I'll just yeah. quickly respond to Andy's comment about um, challenges mentally can be hard to spot. And so we mm -hmm. want to create an environment so people speak up. And that's absolutely true. And I do believe as a psychologist that we can become very good at spotting. 
we know it with our family members. We know it with people. If we're listening and looking, there are subtle cues that aren't subtle anymore when we start to recognize them. And so mm -hmm. how do we start training individuals in the workplace, which we've done successfully at places like Lanolin across uh, the Department of Energy, how do they start attending to those subtle cues so they're not subtle anymore? And how do they pull the string on those so people do come forward more, more actively? So that's all I wanted to add. And I think it's no, Gordon's or Tamara's turn. Thank you. I think it was Tamara, yeah. Bill, and then you, Gordon. You're yeah, and I, you know, I think also there's um, should be some more call of action on leaders to be more in tune to people's body language and facial expressions. I see, I sit in a meeting and a, a senior leader will talk and dominate the whole conversation as if they're on the stage. And then you see everybody else, they're quiet, they're shrinking down in their chairs. It's very clear in the body language that um, people aren't feeling comfortable. So I, I think a challenge today is if you're a leader of a team, take a moment to observe people's body language and facial expressions, mm -hmm. and then pull back and check in, you know, and, and start using those listening skills that we all tout about. Very, I'm very quickly, Tamara, the, um, remember when I started this meeting, I asked everybody for one word of how they were feeling. It could be as simple as that. And then Tanya said she was melancholy. And I asked, do you want to talk about it? She said, no, and you move on. But sometimes people will share. So you can get a real quick read on the room. And but you need to go back. Sorry, Lisa. We need to follow up. Absolutely. We can train to this tomorrow yep. so well in the organizations. And so how do we start as professionals helping our organizations develop those programs and workshops that build that capability for leaders? Yeah. Bill? Okay, Bill, thanks. Do you want to share? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, I haven't been quiet because I wasn't interested. Um, in fact, when I saw this topic, I thought, well, I don't know how, how interested I will be. As you know, I'm an engineer, so my focus is mostly on the, the technical side. But because my focus is how people, operators and managers make decisions in crisis situations, I do have to work a whole lot on the organizational side, but I have never really considered how mental health issues bear on, on that world. But as soon as Rosa said and led off with the statement, emotions are contagious, the light bulb went off big time because not only are emotions contagious, but how one person is feeling in the working environment, um, it spreads rapidly through the entire organization, especially if they're disgruntled or unhappy for whatever reason. And I, I reflect back on my career and I see that a lot when I think about it, but what really, but what really rose to the top uh, in my thinking was my experience working in a nonprofit organization where the workforce, if you will, is uh, our volunteers. When the reason we moved to Texas is I worked for three years in, in a church and it was an organization that was undergoing a lot of issues, dysfunction, and so I was really put in the middle of a crucible of all the issues that we're talking about here. And even then I wouldn't think about it as a mental health thing, but I think it, I think it has the same aspects of how people in an organizational system, how their personal experience can percolate through the whole organization. And when disagreements arise, it, causes stress, but uh, one of the concepts we talked about a lot, and in fact, I had some wonderful um, leadership training 
uh, called the leader's edge during that, <clears throat> during that period. Um, uh, and what we were taught or discussed is how an organization is a system. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts we talked about, and everybody has their role in that system. Well, one of the things we talked about was uh, vibration in a system. And if one person is feeling stressed or disgruntled or whatever, and they start to act out into that, the vibration can spread through the whole system. And uh, so anyway, all that to say, I don't have solutions to the issues we're talking about, but uh, this discussion has really, uh, really struck a chord with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, none of us have the solutions, but uh, hopefully we're starting the conversation and, and we're going to get it more into the consciousness. Gordon, you've, you've been, had your hand up quite a bit and then Gary. Yeah, yeah. it was to follow on from Andy and thank you, Bill, for that. I, I, I can assimilate with that quite a lot in organizations and leadership theory. But, but um, when I uh, entered a bit about legislation, the, the duty of care and the, the UK and European legislation actually did, did dictates that, that the employers have to know. I wanted to lead on after uh, what Andy was saying about how oh, we know about when somebody uh, is about to or bangs their thumb uh, with a hammer when they're trying to bang in the nail, we can deal with visible injuries. In fact, there are solutions to it. And when you think about that analogy is reactive. So we shouldn't be reactive all the time because unfortunately um, uh, those whose mental health deteriorate uh, uh, to the point where they are seeking medical help or or indeed um, suicide and that, is the reactive, it's the after event. So what a lot of employers have now keyed into due to that legislation and compliance, which is enforcement and telling them they have to consider this, is not working reactively all the time, but being dynamic and thinking about what you can do prior to these events going out. And some of, the, some of them are uh, voluntary because you don't want to force anyone to do it, but those who are that inclined, you can do FAA level three, uh, supervising first aid for mental health, as Andy mentioned, there's MINDS, there's also uh, Mental Health England, where you can do basic courses. And, and, then, and that is enabling one or two people, like you might have a welfare rep or a safety rep. It's, it's an education, which you mentioned with Rosa, educating those people about how we can start those conversations. Is there a quiet room or a pastoral room? Is there somewhere we can go to and have a chat? Because nobody in the workplace wants to tell their their, their colleague around the coffee machine, they're, they're not feeling too too good and all that. So all those aspects have been um, yeah. about now and are being introduced into the workplaces. And even here in the maritime environment globally, we, we've done uh, things where it's given the, in the macho male world, the opportunity for a man to speak up uh, without losing face, et cetera, in that sort of thing. And also yeah. uh, as people uh, are, are not inclined to use the word mental health, because that has a stigma, just the title itself, thinking mental, oh, right, you're not quite right in the head. Whereas <laughs> mental, yeah. Use the terminology mental health, because there is good mental health, bad mental health, and there's all those phases in between. And there's a few people that have said here, it's all to do with the emotions. So whatever level you are on a particular day, it might not be the same the, the next day, but uh, not thinking of the word mental in the terminology mental health as being a, yeah. a stigma or a bad thing, but being able to talk about it. So we have discussions where we say, hey, how's your mental health? Um, mental health's great today. You know, I'm all upbeat, I'm quite chipper. Let's have a cup of tea, mate. So uh, that works well, just taking a stigma away from some of the terminology. Yeah. Turning it more into, yeah, getting it into the everyday language. <laughs> and Gary? Yeah, I, I just want to make a connect with a session that we had a couple of weeks ago with Mary and Kylie. It was on Meet the Author, and maybe tomorrow we can add the link on there. Marion actually has been doing our cognitive edge practice in terms of well being, where we've actually used SenseMaker to collect those stories, Andy, on a very anonymous basis here. Because what we're discovering now is that how do we actually make it psychologically safe for people to share those stories? And we are talking right about those water cooler, water cooler stories that you kind of hear. We have now a way that they can actually submit those stories and we can start looking at patterns. So the sort of stuff that we're getting now are these sort of stories that go like, I've got a bad feeling about Henry. So 
because yeah. attitudes are lead indicators. Mm -hmm. We want to flag those things before it become human condition failures, whether it's an outburst, whether it's, gonna, it's a breakdown, whether it's a suicide. Somehow as, as managers, you wanna be able to kind of see that very quickly so you can respond to it very quickly here. So just wanna make that connection there. We have some really cool tools and we are using it. And just one more thing I'll share with you. And I think um, some of you know that uh, we've been working with um, Dominic Cooper and Sunny Gopal. Yeah, and we're he's actually going very anti anti mental health, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I think he is. I think we. I think we've gotten switched because now we realize everything is entangled, intertwined. So we're going to release on a global. Yeah, we're releasing on a global basis a mass sense sort of instrument here, where people can share their stories about workplace safety. They can share it about. Um, mental health they can talk about about how are we dealing with the crisis so we're going to compile that data here and um, it's going to be very fascinating what we're going to find for that and certainly maybe on one of these subsequent programs we'll share some of that data that would be great and, and i I'm, I'm a bit risky here so i'm going to like well maybe you know of course there's always gremlins available around but maybe we show the data live so we can actually play with the data. We can throw to the data. You guys can ask questions. I'll show you like, well, let's find out because yeah. I don't know. I'm looking at the that data at the same time you guys are. That was so, my idea with showing the data today. I say, okay, let's tear it apart. You know, and we had so many questions. So when you gather your stories, one interesting question might be, when you say you're stressed, what does that mean to you? Or what was the last incident that stressed you? That would then we could start to break down what that means. 70% of the workforce is under stress. What the heck does that mean? And how could we begin to help out? Yeah. So I'll be probably posting the link to that survey on LinkedIn. Um, hopefully that means everybody here will get it. And Gord, I've just connected with you. So hopefully you'll, you'll see that. If not, I can send you an invite as well, because I'd certainly like to get your comment and your stories as well. And just kind of like more Mary. stories to marry here. Yeah. It's all about yeah. stories. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that we're at the end of our time, but I just wanted, before we go, did anybody have any last thoughts that they were dying to share? They were living to share. <laughs> living to share? <laughs> okay, then close it out, Rosa. Close it out. You're leaving it up to me. Ah, okay. Well, I just want to say that this conversation was more than I could have hoped for. Uh, it's another example of how, um, you know, the right people that need to be in a conversation will show up if you make the, uh, if you create the opportunity. And, and thank you, Tamara and Lisa, for always being my partners in this. And I want to thank everyone for your insights and contributions. Feel free to um, stay in touch via LinkedIn or emails at, as any thoughts that come up, um, because I, I think it would be really good to start integrating this conversation more into the, uh, into the conferences that are taking place. Right? Uh -huh. Right. Okay. That's it then. Have a great day if you're, I don't know what time it is where you are, but great day or great evening. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Lovely. Bye. Bye.